Yeah. Um, good afternoon um, to all that uh, who have gathered here in person, uh, as well as all who have joined online. Uh, Dr. Gital Pereira, the president of the the College of Palmonologists of Sri Lanka, uh, and all the other distinguished invitees. We are in the process of uh, commencing the monthly clinical meeting organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the uh, another uh, a professional college. Today it will be with the College of Palmonologists of Sri Lanka. Uh, I think uh, we are um, we have selected a topic that would be most appropriate in today's context. It would be on COVID pneumonia and pulmonary sequelae. I just can't think of another time that would be more appropriate than in today's context as we are sort of anticipating uh, a third wave for, uh, of COVID probably over next one or two months. We have a very distinguished panel of experts, pulmonologists, Dr. Amita Fernandu, consultant respiratory physician, Central uh, Chest Clinic Burala, and Dr. Afla Sadikin, again, the consultant respiratory physician, Central Chest Clinic uh, Burala, and senior registrar. Uh, the, they would be joined with uh, Dr. Lakmini Disanayake, Senior Registrar, Respiratory Medicine uh, for this panel to discuss on COVID pneumonia and pulmonary sequelae. So um, let me invite Dr. Amita Fernandu uh, to uh, commence the proceedings uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you, Madam. Good afternoon for those who are present here and our online uh, viewers and listeners. Uh, uh, let me thank the uh, SLMA, its president and council for inviting us to speak on this uh, timely workshop uh, on um, COVID, uh, COVID pneumonia and its pulmonary sequelae. I'm also uh, thankful to our council, Dr. Gita Alper, who is our incumbent president, for uh, selecting me and my panel uh, to speak on this occasion. To start off the proceedings, as is traditional, I will start off with a case discussion. Uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Lakmini Dasanayaka. Uh, senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine to start the proceedings. Thank you. Good, day. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is my first case is Mr. M, 30 year old gentleman from Colombo, who is a known patient with bronchial asthma, well controlled with inhalers, presented with fever and cough for nine days duration. And the COVID PCR was positive on 25th March and transferred to Colombo East Base Hospital for ICU care. On admission, the patient was on uh, face mask oxygen 10 liters per minute. And with that, saturation was 92 and bilateral crepitations were noted. And on admission to the ICU, we changed the patient to high flow nasal oxygen. With that, PaO2 was 95 and PCO2 was 28 with PF ratio of 158. And patient had thrombocytopenia of 96,000 and high inflammatory markers, high CRP and elevated transaminases and standard care of IV dexamethasone and subcut enoxaparin prophylactic dose was started. And the initial chest X-ray shows Peripheral uh, subplural down glass opacities uh, with uh, airspace consolidation. So, uh, and uh, on the third day, the patient we noted the patient was having increased requirement for oxygenation and requiring non-invasive ventilation. And the patient's PaO2 was declining 55 with PF ratio of 263, despite of high ventilatory supports. And the patient's thrombocytopenia slightly improved, but high CRP and high uh, transaminases was noted, and the pro uh, procalcitonin level was slightly elevated. 
on the day five, the patient's oxygen requirement further increased, and with uh, with NIV a point eight FiO two, the patient's PF ratio declined up to one hundred and one, and the patient had high uh, inflammatory markers, high ferritin of more than one thousand six hundred and fifty, high CRP, and high uh, transaminases with uh, normal procalcitonin levels. And at this point, we decided to give IV tocilizumab. I, we, give, we gave IV tocilizumab 480 milligram, that is eight milligram per kg, first dose. And after eight to 12 hours after, we reassessed the patient, still the patient's oxygenation was not improved. And, and we decided to go ahead with the second dose of tocilizumab. And two days following the tocilizumab, that is day seven in the ICU, the patient stability in oxygen requirement was noted with FiO2 of 0.8 and PF ratio was slightly improved, 143. And the chest X-ray was similar to the previous X-ray. On the day nine, we were able to de-escalate oxygen supplementation and was able to change to high flow nasal oxygen. And the patient, had uh, increased PF ratio and also with tocilizumab, uh, we noted dramatic improvement in the inflammatory markers, CRP and transaminases. And uh, the, in the same day, we noted patient saturation was dropping and the patient's PAO2 was coming down and we went ahead with CTPA. The C CTPA, the main pulmonary trunks and the pulmonary trunk and the main pulmonary right and left arteries were normal, but there were subsegmental uh, uh, filling defects noted and suggestive, suggestive of uh, pulmonary embolism. And at this point, we changed enoxaparin to the therapeutic dose and started warfarin. At the uh, same time, the HRCT showed ground glass opacities and peripheral consolidations with uh, parenchymal bands of arcade pattern. And it was suggestive of uh, COVID pneumonia with possible organizing pneumonia as well. And uh, at this point, we decided to start oral prednisolone one milligram per kg as for organizing pneumonia after completing of IV dexamethasone course. The day 12, we were able to further de-escalate the oxygen supplementation and patient was stable with a high flow nasal oxygen 0.35 FiO2 and PF ratio further increased and inflammatory markers uh, were uh, declining and um, the chest x-ray, but the chest x-ray shows peripheral opacities were becoming denser and despite of normal uh, inflammatory markers, these chest X-ray changes was more suggestive of organizing pneumonia. And day 15, we were able to transfer, transfer out the patient from the ICU with venturi mask of 40% and PF ratio was further improved and inflammatory markers were further coming down. And this is the chest X-ray. It shows some improvement than earlier. And day 21, uh, the patient was stable on room air with saturation of 97 and PF ratio was further improved and uh, COVID antibodies were positive and the patient, patient was uh, discharged with prednisolone and warfarin. So in summary, uh, the patient uh, present, this is the graph of the summary in the ICU stay and the blue line shows the FIO to ventilatory support needed and the uh, orange line shows the PaO2 of the patient, oxygenation of the patient, and the gray line shows the inflammatory markers, that is CRP. The patient present to us day one in type one respiratory failure, and the patient was started on high flow nasal oxygen. And with that also, the patient, we noted uh, decrease in oxygenation, which re with requiring NIV support. Despite of increasing ventilatory support, the patient's oxygenation was decreasing. And we, at this point, we decided to give tocilizumab and timely decision of tocilizumab uh, prevented the patient further going down and prevented mechanical ventilation. 
and following tocilizumab we noted patients oxygenation was improving and we were able to de escalate the oxygen support, support and also the patient had high inflammatory markers with normal procalcitonin with tocilizumab we see the dramatic improvement in the inflammatory markers suggesting that it was a hyper inflammatory response was there and uh, once uh, the when the patient was improving there was another decline of oxygenation at that point we have done the ctpa which showed pulmonary embolism and we have changed the enoxaparin prophylactic dose into a therapeutic dose with warfarin and also at the same time we noted patient having organizing pneumonia and we changed uh, we added oral prednisolone following iv dexamethasone course with that the patient uh, started improving again and we were able to deescalate high flow nasal oxygen into venturi mask and send home and uh, the next two cases i will be briefly touching about post covid problems we have encountered this is um, mr q this 72 year old patient with multiple comorbidities and had undergone cabg 7 years ago the patient covid pcr was positive march 24th and at the same time the patient had igm and igg positive for dengue and also and but had ns1 antigen negative the patient was uh, sent to taken to icu for two days for observation and patients had thrombocytopenia of 96000 which went down to 69000 and but there was no uh, leaking and patient's thrombocytopenia improved subsequently patient did not require any form of oxygenation support is a face mask oxygen of high flow nasal oxygen and we did not offer dexamethasone for this patient and patient received enoxaparin prophylactic dose and um, this was the first chest x ray uh, taken initially on the admission the patient had uh, bilateral peripheral ground glass changes in the mid and lower zones and despite of clinical improvement over the next 20 days the patient had radiologically bursting of the shadows in the x ray and we went ahead with a, a hrcd hrcd shows a peri a ground glass opacities with peripheral consolidation and band like consolidation with a parenchymal bands of uh, in the arcade pattern and suggesting of organizing pneumonia and we started him on prednisolone 1 mg per kg and the third case is mr uh, mr r 70 year old uh, with diabetes and hypothyroidism covid pcr was positive on 19 uh, december last year and patient required high flow nasal oxygen and icu was stay was 7 days and patient receives dexamethasone and also prophylactic dose of enoxaparin patient's initial chest x ray was this and even after one month following the discharge the patient has persistent radiological uh, changes and also persistent symptoms of exertional shortness of breath and the, we went ahead with the hrct hrct shows fibrotic bands with traction bronchiectasis and uh, reticulation and also some uh, ground glass changes suggestive of nsip and op overlap and we have started him on steroids and now the patient has taken steroids for around 6 weeks and the patient uh, states the clinical improvement improvements in the symptom wise as well as the radiological improvement was noted Uh, thank you very much thank you lakshmi for those uh, introductory cases uh, it makes my task much more easier uh, when i come to discussing the pulmonary sequelae of covid-19 um so my task is to uh, go, walk you through these cases and uh, see uh, the challenges that we are facing when we are when we are dealing with these patients so over the past few months 
myself, Dr. Afla, Dr. Ravini, and Dr. Asha, uh, the, the chess consultants at the National Hospital, have been overseeing uh, care and working with the team at Mulleri, our base hospital. Uh, we are get grateful for the physicians there um, and the and anesthetist and the supporting radiology, and microbiology, hematology teams that uh, work with us. So in, during my talk, I will uh, go through the pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19, timelines of disease evolution, pathological correlates, because it's important in a, uh, understanding the clinical decision-making process, clinical and radiological markers of the disease stages, challenges in management, uh, discharge and follow-up strategies, and as you saw, post-COVID sequelae, or what we term long COVID syndromes. Uh, as, of, as of March, with over 700 million, 117 million confirmed cases, nearly 3 million cases uh, on a weekly basis, uh, death, uh, nearly 3 million deaths, uh, a death toll of over 2.5 million globally, the COVID pandemic shows no signs of waiting. In fact, we are facing a fourth resurgence with many countries like Germany, uh, France, uh, Brazil, India going into lockdown with daily tolls rising and many strains and many challenges emerging even in spite of a vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccine program that is going on in developing countries, developed countries. Many countries, including India, are experiencing, as I said, a resurgence of cases uh, and thinking of uh, lockdowns and other controlled public health measures. We in Sri Lanka are at 196,000 are at 96,000, reaching the 100,000 mark with 618 deaths. Uh, as you know, many patients with COVID have, uh, are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, but this may be changing. Uh, and recent, just a few minutes ago, I saw a Facebook post which says that uh, patients are having not, not having many upper respiratory symptoms now, and they are presenting with restlessness with a short incubation period. So the challenges are persisting and re-emerging uh, so that we have constantly to be at uh, uh, constantly be on the alert to to deal with these new challenges. Uh, of the patients, 15% as of now will need hospital admission, with 5% 5, 5 needing HDO or ICU care. Those who need ICU care has variable mortality depending on centers, comorbidities, age, obesity, and other risk factors. Uh, about the morbidity in these patients, mortality in these patients are around 16 to 78%. Uh, AKI, cardiac, uh, liver, cardiac disease, liver disease, cerebrovascular, cerebrovascular problems uh, can contribute to mortality. The major cause of mortality and death remain the pulmonary sequelae. These include acute lung injury, adult respiratory distress, adult respiratory distress syndrome, uh, thromboembolic, and pulmonary vascular events. Our experience shows that the highest mortality are in those in the elderly, the obese, those with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic renal disease, post-transplant, kidney transplant patient, malignancy, and interstitial lung disease, uh, uh, in particular of the chronic lung diseases. Uh, in terms of time timelines, COVID has acute, medium, and medium-term manifestations and complications that occur uh, in the first four weeks. Post-COVID manifestations are the persistence of these symptoms from, from four to 12 weeks, and systems can, symptoms can persist or even newly emerge after, four, after 12 weeks, which is now termed post COVID, which is now termed long COVID. So after the acute sequelae, many, as I said, uh, are asymptomatic. They can have a carrier stage. And you, as you know, uh, they are transmissible. The virus is transmissible during the pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic phase. Uh, there is mild to moderate uh, disease in the majority. Uh, severe viral pneumonia with its direct cytopathic effects on the lung, giving rise to diffuse alveolar damage and resultant uh, acute lung injury and ARDS are, the, are what we see in the acute phase. Then we see endothelial dysfunction and pulmonary vasculopathy, uh, which leads to uh, pulmonary hypertension and uh, prothrombotic state, giving rise to uh, pulmonary embolism, microemboli, as you saw in the cases illustrated by uh, Lakmini, which can occur even late in the disease. Uh, then there is this phenotype, the hyper-inflammatory hyper phenotype or the immune, media, in, immune phenotype, uh, which can also give rise to diffuse alveolar damage or dead and its resultant sequelae of acute lung injury and, and ARDS. Organizing pneumonia and it's dis newly described or not uh, what was previously considered a rare form of uh, organizing pneumonia, acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia is also 
uh, we are also beginning to see this, these patients. Then secondary bacterial sepsis, uh, mostly gram negative organisms, but also fungal and other infections are emerging as secondary pathogens. So aspergillus, as we saw during the influenza pandemics, is also playing a significant role. Uh, Co-infection or reactivation of other atypical pathogens like pneumocystis gerasi, uh, CMV, are also being reported, especially in the immun immunocompromised patients who are on uh, immunosuppressive medication, uh, like the post-transplant patients. Then po the long-term uh, sequelae of COVID, the post-COVID uh, symptoms that persist beyond four and last up to 12 weeks uh, may be uh, limited to breathlessness, cough, fatigue, malaise, uh, neuropsychiatric disturbances to more serious complications like interstitial lung disease and thromboembolic phenomena. Of the interstitial lung disease, uh, post-ARDS lung, we have seen, uh, but irrespective of uh, the post-ARDS changes or some changes which may due to volume trauma, barrow trauma as a result of mechanical, mechanical ventilation, we see the fibrotic processes progressing. Uh, and as you saw in the cases illustrated, organizing pneumonia. Also, uh, pulmonary vasculopathy giving rise to pulmonary hypertension, for, for, for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension uh, is also being seen in the in patient that we have managed. So it is important to understand the chronology of events uh, as illustrated by in this graph. Uh, in terms of viremia, pulmonary manifestation, vasculopathic events to organization, recovery or death. It is equally important to correlate this host, these two with host innate immune response, humoral and other antibody response. Uh, incubation periods, as I said, can last from two to 14 days, but average about five days. Viral shedding occurs during the incubation period uh, and asymmetric phase. Therefore, these people are infectious. In mild disease, the immune inflammatory response is mild and runs its course over 10 to 15 days, but they may develop post-COVID sequelae uh, we have seen patients who are in quarantine centers and who are uh, in asymptomatic during the acute phase, presenting later with breathlessness and other problems. Uh, so you can get late sequelae, uh, and this has no relation to the initial acu acute presentations. Uh, in mild, in the hormonal response or the antibody response is peculiar to COVID because what we see initially is an IgG response, and this can be present in the, uh, at day two even, and this can persist for a long period of time. So it has no correlation to your CT values or your viral load initially. So uh, the presence of antibody uh, does not mean that uh, the patient is non-infectious in the early stages. In those with severe disease, the host immune response becomes dysregulated, hyperimmune response leading to a cascade of catastrophic consequences, uh, which results in cytopathic injury uh, to organ systems, microvascular changes, micro uh, microthrombi and embolic events. This can all in the lung, uh, cul 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 culminate in uh, acute lung injury, ARDS, multi-organ failure, particularly renal, liver, uh, CNS, cardiac uh, organs, can, these can be targeted. Uh, profiling these patients in terms of vi viremic cytopathic injury, hyperinflammatory immune response, uh, secondary sepsis, and, uh, and the impact of multi-organ failure becomes critical in the decision-making process uh, because the strategies would be different. It is also important to note that these phases may overlap and it is not necessarily that one leads to the other. Uh, so we as clinicians must pool our expertise uh, and our resources in, uh, and, in identifying these processes and building up a profile of these patients so we can offer better uh, management to these patients. Uh, the pathology plays an important role in these patients. Uh, it's of paramount importance to understanding the disease process, how we relate pathology uh, to the clinical correlation and its bio biomarker profiles and radiology is important. So diffuse alveolar damage or dead uh, can occur any stage of the disease. And then uh, it, it is characterized by a pathology of alveolar damage, pneumocyte damage and hyaline membrane formation. Then there's an aberrant repair process which may occur as early as seven, day seven and, and uh, day 14. So here, here there is an organizing process where there are fibrin uh, balls clog the alveoli. And this uh, has been described as uh, acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia. Uh, so they term the pa patient with COVID as happy hypoxic. The patient's perception of dyspnea and the per per person, the work of breathing is not elevated when you look at the, the how hypoxic the patient is and your blood gases. So this may be due to intra-alveolar shunting. So part of the explanation is that it may be, be microthrombi. The other explanation is I, I feel 
that these patients have organizing pneumonia, intraalveolar buds, and uh, intraalveolar what they call this fibrin balls, giving rise to intraalveolar shunting and VQVQ mismatch. So uh, it's a dysregulated uh, immune process as well as a repair process that we are seeing. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, access to this information uh, in our patients because of the postmortems done. We don't have histology as yet uh, because the, those have not been uh, processed. So it's important to understand this uh, pathological process uh, and, all, and the host immune response so you can target your therapies accordingly and uh, use your armament of investigations and radiology to support you. So the radiology as described earlier by uh, Lakmini uh, plays a key role. What we have access is to the chest radiograph which shows peripheral ground glass basal predominant opacities, uh, which may over time uh, change into consolidations, air bronchograms, uh, cavitations, effusions, uh, lymphadenopathy are unusual in COVID pneumonias. Uh, they describe this at all sign uh, where we see this here, we see a, like at all is island, uh, like you see in the Maldives, you have a, a island, which is sort of told to be like crown glass changes. Uh, how do I get this light back? Yes. Uh, and it is surrounded by area of consolidation. So this at all sign is classically described in organizing pneumonia, which they have described now in COVID pneumonia also, a feature at all sign. So uh, I'm wondering whether this is uh, the result of organizing pneumonia setting in early, especially this fibrinous, acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia setting in early in these patients rather than this being a sequelae of COVID itself. So the radiology will go through uh, this uh, septal thickening, ground glass changes, Graves craving, and in the slide that you see there, uh, the basal predominant consolidation with AR bronchograms uh, that, would that we would classically associate it with uh, ARDS. Also in these patients whom CT access is not easy, uh, bedside ultrasound, lung ultrasound plays an important role because some of these changes that we see in ARDS, subpleural basal consolidation, uh, with the you have the relevant, if you have the expertise, you can identify these patients. So this is a summary of COVID uh, radiological changes, mostly CT, but CT is sometimes not practical and easily accessible. We have the advantage of having uh, review a lot of CTs with, in COVID patients because at Mulleria, the IDH uh, CT is dedicated for COVID patients only. So we have good, excellent radiology support, a husband and wife combination who helps us a lot with the radiology. So we have a lot of experience in looking at radiology, uh, the HRCTs in these COVID patients. And with our background of training and our expertise in interstitial lung disease, we are able to discern a lot of things and uh, this to influence our clinical decision-making process. Uh, so uh, the radiology also has a chronology uh, and the radiological evolution is there from ground glass to crazy paving to uh, consolidations to at all to recovery or death uh, if you recover uh, fibrotic changes that may persist. So day nine, day 13, when we are faced with these decisions, are we going to uh, increase our steroids as Lakmini did uh, in the patient with organizing pneumonia? Uh, are we going to persist with uh, as outpatient steroids uh, to further manage the organizing pneumonia are important decisions that we have to take. So this is another thing that we saw in these patients. We saw uh, in certain patients developing pneumomediastinum and pneumothorax. Uh, these are not patients who are mechanically ventilated, uh, but they developed the uh, interstitial chair. They developed this uh, pneumothorax. So I was wondering uh, what is the explanation for this? And our trainees who are now in the UK, senior registrars in respiratory medicine, who are first line, uh, who are working in big centers like Papworth with ECMO, uh, managing ECMO and everything. Uh, we share our experiences. We are on WhatsApp groups discussing patients. They also have this. Uh, they have also seen these patients with uh, pneumothoraces and pneumomediastin. Uh, we see this in advanced fibrotic lung diseases where intra alveolar rupture can occur. Alveolar rupture can occur, giving rise to an interstitial emphysema and this AR tracking uh, to the mediastinum and to the uh, and giving rise to pneumothoraces. So it is something that you should be mindful of, and this occurs in the non-ventilated patients also. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we don't know whether pneumocystis, uh, which is a, can be a co-infection, in, in whom we see in patients who are immunosuppressed, uh, developing uh, pneumothoraces and pneumomediastinum with a, a reactivation of uh, pneumocystis geroasi, especially in the post-transplant immunosuppressed patient, plays a role. Uh, uh, this is again, uh, this organizing pneumonia uh, to illustrate what they call this intra-alveolar fibrin balls. Okay. So thromboembolic disease, we should have a low threshold to suspect thromboembolism as we saw in our patient. Usually we don't have the luxury of a CTPA. Uh, we, we can at uh, Mulleri hour, 
uh, but uh, sometimes these patients are on CPAP and high flow nasal oxygen and transporting them becomes a bit of an issue. So we have a very low threshold uh, to, trans, uh, to convert from uh, prophylactic to treatment dose uh, of enoxiparin. And then uh, if the D-dimers are rising and we have the patient is hypoxic uh, with the with alkalotic pH CO2 washout, we, have, we, we will start them on uh, treatment dose of enoxiparin. And post-discharge, we have, will follow the usual uh, thromboprophylaxis uh, protocols. So our current management strategies are enoxiparin, uh, prophylactic dose, uh, and a treatment dose uh, escalating to a treatment dose with a low threshold for uh, uh, PE. Uh, if the saturations are low on rare air or with supplemental oxygen, uh, as is now standard of care, and from the data coming from the recovery trial, we would give dexamethasone 6 milligrams IV daily for 10 days or until discharge. Uh, we would give broad spectrum antibiotics, initially safe tracks on, maybe play it through atypical cover, but we should guide our, our uh, antibiotic choices based on procalcitonin, which is now available. Uh, it, it's deemed costly, but when you compare with the antibiotic cost, having serial procalcitonins and excluding bacteremic sepsis uh, would, uh, we, would save on a lot of uh, costs on money and also uh, uh, prevent emergence of resistant pathogens. So high flow nasal cannula oxygen, self proning, uh, and uh, CPAP are some of the modalities we use. And we must be thankful to Dr. Afla, who through donations were able to get four, four high flow devices uh, through his contacts uh, to Mulleria Base Hospital. Uh, one uh, unit costing about 1.2 million. I think one, one of these devices cost about 1.2 million. So we must thank Afla on behalf of our, all of us and our college. Uh, so, uh, the fluid strategy in this patient will be euvolumic, neck nebulization, because they are thought to have thick, very viscid secretions, but I couldn't find any evidence for that. But now we don't give HCQ in patients who are hypoxemic and hospitalized. Uh, so, these are the challenges we faced around day 7, day 14, and they are a critical decision that we need to make. Uh, if there is patient deterioration, oxygen demands increase, uh, incre increasing, uh, what is the reason for this? Is this a progression of vire vire viremia? Is this cytopathic injury to the uh, alveoli and your lung giving rise to acute lung injury, ARDS? Is it a hyperinflammatory response, a dysregulated immune response with your inflammatory markers, your IL-6, your IL-1, and all the other cascade of inflammatory markers going up? Is it secondary sepsis, bacterial sepsis? Is it fungus, uh, fungal? Is aspergillus playing a part? Uh, are, are, are these deterioration due to thromboembolic event? Uh, events. Uh, nextly, uh, next, we also have to think of this uh, organizing pneumonia. This where we saw radiological changes cons consistent with uh, uh, organizing pneumonia. In fact, some people argue that the terms that we use, high, happy hypoxemic patient, uh, disproportion, the patient is hypoxemic, but the work of breathing is not increased. The same terms we have used for this acute organizing pneumonia. So are we uh, okay with the steroid dose of the six milligrams de dexamethasone. Should we escalate our uh, steroid doses to higher doses in such patients? So these are the decisions that we are faced with. So uh, multi-organ failure can occur uh, as a result of any of these and uh, give rise to uh, cardiac and renal injury. So a chest X-ray that looks worsening, a chest X-ray does, does that look worsening uh, does not merely mean that there is secondary bacterial sepsis and you don't need to escalate your antibiotics unless there are supportive evidence. In this regard, procalcitonin plays a vital role. If your procalcitonin is negative, you can safely uh, feel that uh, bacteremic sepsis is very unlikely. CRP rises can be due to hyperimmune responses and other inflammatory things. Uh, the uh, the X-ray changes can occur due to fluid overload uh, which as a result of AKI or cardiac injury. You are pro-BNPs, BNPs, your cardiac troponins and your renal parameters will help you understand this. Uh, so uh, it is a multidisciplinary uh, process where uh, each of our expertise are come into play and we have a process of multidisciplinary decision making. So in whom should we give tocilizumab? It, this is much debated and I think later on you'll hear a little bit of, about the data on this and the studies when Afla speaks, uh, he does this, uh, when, he, when Afla speaks. Uh, so sometimes uh, we, in a Patient who is deteriorating, oxygen demand increasing, X-ray worsening, um, bedside ultrasound if you can, showing bi bilateral B lines. There's no evidence of fluid overload, no evidence of injury, procalcitonin is normal, no evidence of sepsis, no evidence of thromboembotic events. Uh, your uh, D-dimers are not very high or CTP if you have the luxury of having it, it's negative. Then it's likely to be hyperimmune. 
So what characterizes this? There is a marked inflammatory response. Your D dimers should rise. Uh, your CRP, uh, the cutoffs that the recovery data says is 75 milligrams. Uh, is considered hyperinflammatory. Your serum ferritin, we have we do the serum ferritin, but the reports don't arrive in time, and we don't have the luxury of doing serial serum ferritins uh, to monitor this hyperinflammatory response. But they are usually in their thousands, and your LDH also start, start rising. If you have your clinical suspicion, your radiological support, and uh, your blood gas and other parameters, and uh, supported by one or two of these biochemical parameters, we would consider such a patient. Uh, having a cytokine storm uh, and uh, providing IL-6 receptor uh, uh, blocks, blockers, tocilizumab, which is the drug available here. There are other drugs, but not available here. Uh, there is IL-6 levels you can estimate. Uh, there is a machine at IDH, but at currently due to uh, other factors like uh, calibration and things, the machine is not functional, but IL-6 levels are not usually done and not needed in these patients. So the data on tocilizumab is a little bit cloudy or controversial. Uh, initial data did not show very good, uh, very good uh, uh, outcomes, but this may be due to the fact that these patients were given tocilizumab as a monotherapy and they didn't have the steroids. So uh, the more, more recent studies, right, REMCAP and other recovery studies, steroids have become, dexamethasone has become the standard of care. So as a result, uh, these patients get a combination of the, the, the steroid plus the tocilizumab. So in such studies and more recent studies, uh, they have showed a better outcome in these patients. Again, in the mechanically ventilated patient, we talk about these two phenotypes, the L-type the, with low elastance, high compliance, and the H-type, uh, the, uh, the high elastance, low compliance patients. The low elastance patients uh, have more VQ mismatch, intraalveolar shunting, as, as mentioned before, maybe due to microthrombi, maybe due to intraalveolar intra buds, and uh, maybe that's why the, 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 this um, low elastance group are hypoxemic. Whereas the high last, they have a dry lung and their fluid strategies are different uh, where you have to have a U-volumic fluid strategy. Then the high elastance types, are, which are more ARDS, which are wet lungs, which uh, your, uh, your chest CT, as I told, mentioned before, and your ultrasound will show subpleural basal consolidations uh, are more uh, uh, lungs, which you will try your recruitment, rec recruitment maneuvers like uh, proning, and uh, you're using your PEEP to recruit uh, consolidated lung. Uh, so moving on from the acute things, uh, then we, as I mentioned before, and as illustrated in the cases, uh, we move on to long COVID or post COVID sequelae. Uh, those about 10% will have post COVID sequelae or ongoing symptoms of long COVID. Uh, this is irrespective of the fa fact that uh, these patients have had intensive care or HDU visits uh, or intensive care, being in intensive care units. So this may uh, vary from shortness of breath to pyrometric dysfunction, fatigue and all, to uh, severe, uh, significant sequelae of uh, ongoing pulmonary, new or ongoing pulmonary embolic disease, uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension to interstitial lung disease, which may vary, vary from uh, organizing pneumonia, as was illustrated in the case, cases, to uh, interstitial pathology, uh, which was uh, like a non-specific interstitial pneumonia. So I won't go through these algorithms. These are BTS, which proposes these algorithms. Uh, some patients will have mild disease, will have remote consultations. I'm told that they are given a pulse oximeter at home to monitor their oxygen saturation. If the oxygen saturation is declined, they are asked to uh, immediately report, and such patients may go through a diagnostic workup including uh, D-dimers, CTPA, ferritins, uh, to see whether there is high inflammation still going on, and they will have relevant imaging like CTPAs and high resolution CT scans. Um, so this I mentioned. Uh, so pulmonary vascular disease and pul pulmonary hypertension, uh, as I said, this is a very prothrombotic disease in which uh, pulmonary embolism, and as a result, pulmonary hypertension, and uh, due to vascular endothelial dysregulation. regulation, pulmonary hypertension can, can occur. In some centers in these patients who are in the I, 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 in intensive care units, they have given IV prostacycline or nebulized prostacycline to treat this pulmonary hypertension, but uh, I couldn't find anything pertaining to this uh, in my reading uh, as of yet. But uh, even in UK center, between centers, there's different uh, difference in protocols. So this organizing pneumonia that you saw uh, is also, uh, we have seen in the po post-influenza, but we are seeing much more of them now and much earlier. Uh, 
uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, so these are the features of organizing pneumonia. So you have to make a distinction from uh, resolving COVID when you look at this HRCT. In resolving COVID, you'll see more ground glass changes, uh, reticulation and all, but in uh, organizing pneumonia, you are seeing very thick parenchymal bands, what we call uh, arcades, plural based arcades, and this at all signs. Uh, so uh, it can have organizing pneumonia like feature or a more fibrotic disease. So uh, there, there will be a significant disease burden. Now we have had 100,000 people who have had COVID. Uh, about 10% of them will have symptoms of long COVID, not only lung, uh, neurological, cardiac, renal. So we are looking at a uh, uh, public health or problem also, and a problem, a problem where healthcare systems may get inundated with this. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about non-pulmonary complications, just briefly a slide, slide on that. Uh, but these are also, and of course, we must, uh, we must uh, keep in mind that uh, the psychological consequences of this are also uh, there. So people need reassuring, people feel uh, uh, scared, and uh, they lose self-confidence. So we need to pay attention to the psychological aspect also. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I got a, there, there was a patient I saw. Uh, she has been in a private hospital about four, about four months, uh, one month back with, up, with respiratory tract symptoms. Uh, she had delivered four months ago. Uh, in this hospital, she hasn't had a, a, a PCR done or she hasn't uh, had uh, antigen done. She has been managed for a respiratory tract infection and discharge because of persistent breathlessness. She came to the private sector. She had an X-ray which showed ground glass changes. I did a CT and the CD showed, CT showed uh, organizing pneumonia changes. And when I did the COVID antibody, the COVID antibody is positive in a high theta. So there are patients who will crop up like that and you have to have a high low threshold to suspect this. So in conclusion, pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19 range have, can show a variety of changes. And as you, as you saw, uh, the disease is evolving, the challenges are evolving, and we have to be, uh, we have to, uh, be up to, the, up to uh, be on, on the alert all the time. Uh, the things that I would like to discuss uh, with the uh, other people who are managing COVID, uh, it's the dexamethasone do dose that we, are, that we are giving of six milligrams, uh, milligrams daily IV enough in these patients on whom we are suspecting organizing pneumonia. Recently, there was SR who returned, uh, my SR who returned from the UK. He said if they are seeing changes of organizing pneumonia, they double the dexamethasone dose. They increase it to uh, in increase it to 18, mill 18 milligrams or, uh, of dexamethasone. So, uh, should we increase the steroid dose? Should we look more carefully as to at tocilizumab? Uh, these are the things that we have to discuss uh, uh, among ourselves in our strategies of managing these patients. So, and I also I feel that death reviews are important. We have had 618 plus deaths, uh, but uh, we haven't had a death review where the relevant expertise sit, experts sit down and discuss this. Uh, and it's important, I feel, that we have access to histology to know how our patients behave. Are our patients more prothrombotic? Are our patients more uh, ARDS acute lung injury patients? Uh, how, how does other organ system damages damage uh, play a role? So it's important that we have access to this information. Uh, so I think we'll have a time for discussion. Uh, so I'll conclude my talk uh, uh, with this. Uh, it's my present task to uh, call Dr. Afla Sadikin, uh, consultant respiratory physician, NHSL, and Central Chest Clinic, uh, my colleague, uh, to uh, take us to the next segment of the session. Thank you very much, sir, for that kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and College of Pulmonology Sri Lanka for giving me the opportunity. So uh, this is... Uh, more or less like a scientific uh, uh, analysis of our, or whatever we have discussed over the last few minutes about uh, COVID pneumonia and the pulmonary sequelae. So though uh, as a tradition, we just go through the MCQs and I'm not going to take the MCQs for you all to uh, answer the question and to get what, how much we got correct and how, much, how, how many we got uh, wrong. So basically there are four MCQs and uh, but uh, going to take those um, responses in detail on a scientific um, uh, explanation, right? So uh, first question, uh, which is not a feature of cytokine syndrome in COVID pneumonia, and uh, a increase ferritin levels, b leukocytosis, c fever, d elevated IL six level, e elevated LDH. 
Right. So my uh, discussion or the uh, is on some of the things we have discussed before, just to re-emphasize uh, to uh, how much we have gathered and how much we should focus, how, how much we should focus on in the um, COVID patients management in the future. So we all we all heard about these three stages. That is the early infection, pulmonary phase, and hyperinflammation phase. In fact. What we see here is that is commonly at our, in our setup is the pulmonary phase and the hyperinflammation phase, which can be uh, overlap and may be difficult to differentiate. However, the presence of clinical symptoms of shortness of breath uh, with uh, evidence of hypoxia in critical ill patients, uh, uh, checking with the PF ratio is quite important to decide of the decide the treatment modality. So uh, obviously your uh, radiology and your blood uh, levels for, for, to exclude infection, secondary infection is quite important to decide on the treatment modality. And uh, we must never forget that the uh, hyperinflammation is uh, taken a big uh, uh, area in the COVID pneumonia. But uh, remember the hyperinflammation is not something new for us because we all know that uh, the uh, HLH or hemophagocytic lympho uh, lymphohistiocytosis is uh, something we have come across in some of those infections like TB and also rheumatic, uh, rheumatic diseases. But here in uh, COVID pneumonia, it has a, a classic uh, descriptive way of um, uh, defining the hyperinflammation uh, in uh, COVID pneumonia. So we all know that uh, if you take the HLH criteria for uh, uh, symptoms and symptom signs and investigative um, biomarkers for uh, uh, hyperinflammation, the uh, COVID pneumonia hyperinflammation is something uh, characterized by having fever and anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, uh, hyperfibrinogenemia, uh, also hyperferritinemia. If the, the presence of uh, uh, transaminase, elevated transaminase is something which they have described, but uh, still the evidences are not that uh, uh, conclusive on that. <coughs> if you take the criteria in COVID pneumonia hyperinflammation, the, they have uh, put up the fever as many as more than 38 Celsius, also, macrophage activation is defined by uh, high serum ferritin more than 700. The hematological dysfunction, which is very important, especially in the uh, initial phase where the neutrophil and lymphocyte ratio is more than 10, and also uh, low platelets. <coughs> Yeah, also presence of coagulopathy, like uh, Amitya sir said that uh, the uh, higher D-dimer concentration is also uh, another indirect way of assessment of hyperinflammation. And if you can demonstrate cytokinemia where the IL-6 levels more than 15 is a, a good uh, biomarker to uh, uh, show the hyperinflammation in COVID-19. So Manson and the group, they wanted to uh, minimize or to make it very easy to come down uh, to define the hyperinflammation in COVID-19. So in their cohort of studies, when the patients, they came with evidence of hyperinflammation on admission, so also nine hyperinflammation on the other uh, patients who have who were admitted with pneumonia, they came out with a, a plan to say that the uh, uh, hyperinflammation on CRP level is more than 150 or within two hours, the baseline should go up by 50. And uh, uh, presence of high ferritin for more than 1500 and IL-6 levels more than 15. However, this cohort of patients had their overlapping um, uh, uh, features with secondary bacterial infection and also those patients, some uh, admitted direct to the ICU for um, high oxygen demand. So what we have learned here now is when it comes to um, uh, cytokine syndrome in pneumonia, increased ferritin levels, fever, elevated IL-6 level and elevated LDH level is quite, uh, it's established, but not leukocytosis. It is neutrophil versus lymphocyte ratio of more than 10. So which is, uh, we'll discuss about uh, uh, drugs when it comes to COVID pneumonia treatment. 
So we all know that the use of dexamethasone HCQ, tocilizumab, GMCSF, and Akinura is another IL-1 antagonist. So what is the drug which is not useful in COVID pneumonia? So just to go again in uh, detail of uh, 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 treatment modalities, you know, uh, over the last one and a half years or so, there had been a lot of debates uh, all over the world about uh, uh, finding ideal drug for COVID pneumonia. So there had been a lot of speculation on antibiotics like azithromycin, HCQ, and also use of um, uh, later use of uh, dexamethasone and uh, enoxaparin or uh, anticoagulation. So uh, however, the recovery trial is the one which really came up with a very good, um, uh, well-designed study uh, to uh, you know, to include all those uh, antivirals, dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin to look at the outcome, especially the primary endpoints of all cause death and duration of hospitalization and ventilation, need for ventilation and need for renal replacement therapy as a secondary endpoints. So, this study uh, basically showed that uh, dexamethasone has had been a very uh, uh, important drug for the COVID pneumonia management, and now it has become the standard of care many, uh, standard of care approach. So basically they have found that patients who were on invasive mechanical ventilation, also who, who needed oxygen, um, uh, had a good response to, uh, compared to the usual care. And the, even all patients, in, even the, 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 there was no uh, supportive evidence to use dexamethasone in uh, of patients who did not receive oxygen uh, showed still uh, uh, a good response uh, to minimize, bring down the hospitalization and require uh, uh, to uh, duration of the hospitalization, uh, also to requirement of uh, mechanical ventilation. Now, so in the in those uh, 2,104 patients, they found that one third of those ventilated patients, death can be prevented by dexamethasone. So it's a big achievement or within very short time, uh, we have achieved to at least a drug for standard of care. So what about hydroxychloroquine? We all know that there was a big hype uh, at the outset of, uh, uh, at the onset of this COVID pneumonia pandemic. And also I know that uh, there are some centers still they are quite uh, mm, uh, uh, convincing, uh, convinced that uh, use of hydroxychloroquine uh, is uh, uh, for, as for the COVID pneumonia management. However, in the recovery trial, it is clearly showed out of 1,542 patients who, was, who received randomized, uh, who received HCQ, showed that no clinical benefit. So we can safely say it has no clinical benefit using in COVID pneumonia. Now, as uh, Amitha sir said, uh, interleukin C receptor antagonist or this tocilizumab was a, uh, you know, a drug which came with a big hype initially, but however, there had been a lot of uh, confusing results initially. But later, the, the evidence came uh, quite uh, promising for those uh, timely used interleukins uh, 6 receptor or the tocilizumab for those critical ill patients who needed um, high flow nasal oxygen or uh, who, who needed uh, non-invasive clinical ventilation. So they have in the uh, remap cap, uh, trial, they clearly showed that uh, those patients uh, basically uh, mm, uh, receiving organ support, especially on the, uh, in terms of oxygen, they did really well, including their survival. But if you go back to the previous studies, which was uh, done in uh, done as an impact um, um, trial, and even though they showed that there was no overall all cause mortality by day 28, there had been no difference, but still it showed that uh, requiring mechanical ventilation and also uh, medium time to clinical failure up in day 28 is significantly reduced with the use of uh, tocilizumab. And uh, this, this top trial uh, using 3,924 patients uh, after uh, getting, giving 433 patients with tocilizumab, it has showed that 30 day, 30 day mortality was reduced in tocilizumab patients. That is 27% uh, uh, compared to 
37% in non tocilizumab i think it's quite significant in those uh, sick critically ill patients however all those overlapping or uh, non convincing data could be all because of the unmeasured confounding factors the squacta study uh, did had that issue in fact uh, they they found that in that study uh, that uh, there was no difference between tocilizumab and placebo probably uh, it's interesting it was done by the roche uh, was sponsored by the roche company where the tocilizumab was uh, they are the people who uh, originally uh, produced the tocilizumab and in that uh, study itself initially showed uh, there is no difference between uh, tocilizumab and placebo however it is important to understand all these later study uh, earlier studies they did not have dexamethasone or those patients had a number of uh, patients used dexamethasone were like 18% 32% but if you go back to um, uh, remam caps uh, study in that 88% of the patients had dexamethasone as the standard of care so their survival benefit uh showed uh, or the positive results showed with tocilizumab because of probably use of dexamethasone what about gmc sf so i know it's a um, it's something very um, uh, challenging and set up uh, giving uh, gmc sf in certain patients but when you manage severe covid pneumonia who need the uh, mechanical ventilation and sometimes uh, you, you are really as a clinician you are really helpless and you are really looking forward for something to give to improve the oxygenation because otherwise patient is perfectly all right you cannot improve the oxygenation patient is just drowning without oxygen so uh, so they in this single center prospective cohort study they found that uh, out of uh, 33 patient 13 13 patient all of them have got fast improvement and without progression to death so i think uh, it's something uh, we will be looking forward in the near future as well so anakin right has been a drug or this il1 blocker is been a drug used by the rheumatologists and in many rheumatological conditions and in the um, uh, in the small study which was published in lancet has shown a good promising um, results uh, though it's a small prospective uh, study with a prospective um, uh, data uh, but still it has shown a good results uh, for uh, mortality reduction so now we know that uh, in when it comes to severe covid pneumonia management use of dexamethasone tocilizumab gmc sf and anakindra probably to some extent very useful but we are now certainly we are very certain that use of hcq has no place so just we'll go through the the radiological features so we saw a lot of x rays a lot of uh, hrct films so just to recap and to consolidate our knowledge on x rays and hrct so what are the common features which what is the feature which we will not usually see in covid pneumonia is it peripheral zonal air space consolidation opacities along with peripheral uh, along the periphery of both lung in the chest x ray or is it diffuse ground glass opacities in the hrct crazy pavy pattern in hrct parenchymal bands in hrct and bilateral pleural effusion i think the answer is quite straightforward what we see usually in chest x rays in um, uh, pneumonia patients where uh, you get bilateral probably sometime asymmetrical basal predominance peripheral subpleural uh, ground glass uh, opacification with sometimes with consolidation so this asymmetrical uh, appearance is quite common in uh, covid pneumonia when it comes to hrct yes we have we saw so many hrcts we uh, heard uh, from amita sir about the hrct findings yes what you usually see is diffuse um, uh, ground glass uh there is no um, a certain pattern for this ground glass distribution but sometime it's a periglobular distribution is uh, described in addition to that we see a <coughs> peripheral um uh, organizing um uh, uh, band like uh, areas maybe with the uh, features of uh, uh crazy paving pattern so we all see all these things so what we don't see is the bilateral pleural effusion so commonly if you see bilateral pleural effusion we should think of the other uh, possibilities like uh, uh, fluid overload or even cardiac involvement with covid pneumonia so the last question 
uh, what is not, which is not a feature after recovery of severe COVID pneumonia. So we see a lot of COVID pneumonia patients, and uh, but we are not fully aware what can happen to these patients even after the recovery. So is it pulmonary embolism, long COVID syndrome, lung fibrosis, DLCO reduction, normal six minute walking test. Right, just to go through, basically pulmonary embolism or thrombotic uh, phenomena is very well described and they have found up to five to 30% will develop thrombosis. And uh, microthrombosis is the key mediator when it comes to COVID pneumonia and also uh, end organ damage, including acute kidney injury. So it, uh, it poses a major mo uh, morbidity and mortality. So the study, uh, uh, the multi-platform RCT, uh, that is a collaboration between three trial platforms have found that the thrombotic events are still possible even those patients uh, who were uh, anticoagulated for uh, uh, therapeutic anticoagulation or even as a thrombophoriasis, even moderate as well as the severe cases. So still these patients are going to have continued to can have microthrombosis and thromboembolism. So it can be just the pulmonary thromboembolism, what we heard uh, from Amit sir, that is about um, and also leading into pulmonary hypertension. So long COVID syndrome, we heard about long COVID syndrome and uh, which is a, with the, the def, by definition, when you have signs and symptoms which last for more than four weeks after recovery of COVID-19 pneumonia. So you can uh, put into two categories or two stages. You can have ongoing symptoms that last for four to, two, to 12 weeks from the onset of your uh, symptoms of COVID pneumonia. Or you can have uh, after recovery, where the symptoms last for more than 12 weeks, which cannot be explained by any other diagnosis. Now, when it comes to symptoms, it is not purely respiratory symptoms. We have to remember that. So what we are looking, we are worried is the respiratory symptoms where development of uh, non-specific interstitial pneumonia or um, organizing pneumonia and probably thromboembolic phenomena also. So the, the, the European Respiratory Journal, which was published recently, have shown that uh, in that study, they have shown that, uh, that the patients who did not have any previous existing uh, interstitial lung disease have developed 15 to 50% of dropping of DLCO in these patients. It's a very significant num num number. So after one to three months following COVID pneumonia. So remember that Dropping of DLCO is maybe something we have to make ourselves aware that uh, there is an interstitial process going in these patients where we he, patient needs uh, intensive investigations and treatment uh, early as possible. However, when you do the DLCO too early, that means within three months, you are uh, functional assessment, when you want to assess the functional um, capacity. So basically it may overestimates uh, whatever the uh, disease impact on the lungs. So you must not do DLCO within three months and must always look for any dropping of DLCO after three months. And uh, the, the, the Swiss uh, observational study after COVID pneumonia in that big study, they showed that patients who have recovered after severe and critical disease after um, uh, COVID pneumonia has a significant reduction of DLCO on uh, predicted values also reduce six minute walking distance. And also they have a, a, a obvious exercise reduction, uh, exercise induced uh, hypoxemia. So basically what we know here is these patients after COVID recovery of severe COVID pneumonia, they can still have pulmonary embolism. They can have long COVID syndrome. They can develop into long fibro lung fibrosis and also DLC reduction, but not they are not a six minute walk test is not going to be normal within that four months. Thank you. So this is the, I'm going to bring this uh, uh, last two slides to uh, uh, recall what uh, Amita sir said. But remember uh, the thorax uh, with the BTS, they have published these uh, two um, uh, protocols, especially people even for the GPs to follow up uh, that even with mild to moderate symptoms. They, are, they can still have after 12 weeks, uh, they are um, uh, X-ray changes. And at what point we are going to do the pulmonary function test and even including high resolution CT scan and CTPS if you are suspecting ongoing symptoms. And also especially 
patients who are recovering from uh, coming from out of the ICU or HDU, their protocol uh, even looking for persistent symptoms uh, through the same investigation, but at a, at a different level, including the respiratory physician or the IND specialist. Thank you. Yeah, the, if I may ask you that uh, um, now um, when the patients are being treated in ICU, you know that they are with symptoms, uh, they need investigations, and we all are geared to plan investigations for these patients. Is there a place for routine screening of asymptomatic patients for these complications? Um, not really. Uh, but mo most of the asymptomatic patients, uh, what would they would do is uh, look for respiratory symptoms, uh, breathing difficulties, breathlessness. Uh, what do they do in other countries? They give a, give a pulse oximeter and to check their resting saturation and saturation on exertion. Uh, because this perception of dyspnea, as we said, this hy happy hypoxic patient um, may manifest late. Uh, so it may be a remote consultation. I'm talking about a developed setting. Uh, where remote consultations may happen. Uh, in such settings, uh, there may be a re remote consultation. If there's a drop in saturation and all, uh, they would be asked to come to the hospital. Uh, and as I said before, uh, the, this long COVID or post COVID patients who keep turning up, who have been asymptomatic during quarantine and other period times, but then they are coming later on, four, four, 12 weeks, uh, four weeks to 12 weeks uh, without persistent of symptoms, but with new symptoms ranging from fatigue, chronic fatigue, to uh, neuropsychiatric disturbances, to um, respiratory and other manifestations. Uh, so um, I would say that initial screening with investigations would not be cost effective. Afla, would you like to add something? I think uh, why it is not practical is the large number of patients, if everybody come, turns up to, uh, for medical attention uh, for, because already they, are, they have gone through that anxious period, of, uh, though they were asymptomatic. So I think, uh, like Amitisha said, it's not going to be cost effective to screen everybody. Uh, the uh, other clarification that I had was that uh, the, the story that was related by Dr. Amita Fernando with regard to a patient who had had infection, we thought about four months ago and now appearing with the respiratory manifestations. Uh, could we imagine that we're not doing a, taking a COVID in this country for a person who has had a respiratory infection four months ago? Uh, this, yes, this patient really, ha she had, she was symptomatic. She had respiratory symptoms. Uh, in fact, she was hospitalized, in fact, for I think about two or three days and treated uh, treated for uh, lower respiratory tract infection. Uh, there was extra uh, also done at that time. I can't remember the blood count, lymphopenia and things. Uh, but uh, then uh, the, when I asked the patient whether she had an antigen test or which would happen anyway here now, yes, uh, exactly. whether I, I agree with you, whether it's acceptable at this time, at this time, because they are infectious and they, are, they have to be quarantined and they can have serious consequences also of their, from themselves. That's right, yes. And uh, what is the place for ACI in COVID management? Uh, uh, in, initially, they were saying that angio receptor uh, uh, tensile receptor sites receptor site is where the virus gains entry uh, into the cells so uh, there was uh, things about withholding people who are on ac inhibitors withholding ac inhibitors but now there's no evidence for that and they don't they, they don't advise on withholding the ac receptor blockers uh, as a therapeutic modality or initial thing i don't think there's any data to support use of this there are other things like ivermectin which is anti -hel helminthic uh, which is cheap, which is which is available here in the early stages of disease, where our patients were not hypoxemic, they were mildly symptomatic. Uh, we have used ivermectin, 12 BD, and uh, six milligrams daily for five days. Uh, but I mean, I don't know whether there's any randomized control data on that. The saturation target in COVID management. And the saturation target, uh, 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 rest, resting saturation of 94. Uh, and if uh, on supplemental oxygen, that is uh, four liters uh, or for forty percent oxygen, nasal prongs or face mask. Face mask. Uh, if the saturation is uh, not maintained above ninety four, uh, then would uh, we would go for dexamethasone, enoxaparin, uh, so high flow nasal oxygen, uh, and uh, may have to escalate to uh, CPAP or NIV. Right. So I could open uh, for any questions from the audience.
I think for me, comment, uh, uh, it would be nice if we could have a centralized multidisciplinary, I have been telling Madam also, uh, a team of critical care uh, specialists, uh, yeah, physicians, intensivists, uh, respiratory physicians, uh, radiologists, uh, with support from microbiology, hematology, and other, other fields, and uh, renal, neurological, where relevant, where we have a centralized uh, team of experts where we can deal with these issues and come when they come because they are, we are it's a learning experience and also pooling resources and also um, utilizing our resources maximally. So I think we have a college intercollegiate guideline committee, SLMA as a committee, uh, that would be a good if that initiative can be taken, madam. Thanks, thank you very much, Amit. The, uh, I think that uh, uh, um, we uh, were able to uh, go through um, one of the most productive, uh, uh, most uh, uh, informative, uh, up-to-date uh, account on the uh, management of COVID pneumonia and pulmonary sequelae. Uh, they were able to address the acute management as well as the features of long, long COVID. And uh, generally, I think that many of us are not experienced in managing COVID patients because for most of us, as the PCR becomes positive, it's a sort of matter of transferring the patient to the COVID center. So that uh, beyond that, we thought that it's the infection specialist that who would manage patients. But now we understand how much of multidisciplinary involvement and how much of a contribution that has to be they are from the uh, pulmonology side and uh, the complexities involved uh, and uh, uh, the need to give care for many of, for many of us. The uh, impression was that it's just the symptomatic management, but I mean, uh, what more is involved beyond that symptomatic management, how closer monitoring is needed for these patients who are critically ill. So I think that it was a sort of a very comprehensive account that we got with regard to management of COVID and the complications. And I know that you had to uh, spend a lot of your personal time as well as the effort in uh, making it a reality, making this uh, uh, the whole panel uh, uh, discussion uh, a reality today. So on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I'm very grateful and thankful to the College of Pulmonologists for this, uh, uh, for the, the contribution that was made uh, uh, to make this academic program a great success. From our side, I'm thankful to Dr. Achala Balasuriya, who lies on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So keeping with our traditions, let me uh, show our this, uh, appreciation of the Sri Lanka Medical Association so that brings to an end of our monthly clinical meeting. Thank you very much for all who uh, stayed with us online and in the audience for joining with us this meeting. Thank you very much.